Um, Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to read, and we're going to get to work today. So uh, if, if you don't have your Bible, it's going to be up on the screen. Ephesians chapter 2, it says this, Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, and we're going to break all these Bible words down, Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at the that you were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and stranded to the covenants of promise, having in hope, having no hope and without God in the world. I'm gonna turn around, I think I'm getting blind y'all. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought by near the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. I love that. We see that over and over that God is our peace. If you don't have peace this morning, I, I, would, I would ask that you would look at your relationship with God because you can't have a relationship with God without peace. Who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Verse 15, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances that he might create himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. Verse 16, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. That's good news this morning. Verse 19, so then you are all no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of, of the household of God. The last two verses say this. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for, uh, into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now, a lot of people think that a pastor can read the scripture and be like, all right, this is what it says. I read this this week and I was like, I need to read that like a hundred more times. Because if, if my, my face looked like your face, like what the heck did we just read? And so we're going to break that down today. We're going to talk about it. Uh, but first, let's pray. God, we love you. God, I thank you for all that you're doing in this family. I thank you that you're growing us, that you're loving us, that your love towards us never stops. You don't stop pursuing us. You don't stop caring for us. It is not in your nature to do that. But Father, it's in your nature to always be a loving, pursuing, compassionate, graceful Father in heaven. And we thank you that you've proved that through your son, Jesus. So Father, make your son, Jesus, known today because we glorify him. We lift his name up this morning. We love you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Uh, so we've been in a series for the past few weeks called Sit, Walk, Stand. And the whole idea was that in, in the church world, we, we, we see if you maybe were new to church at some point, that as soon as you get in, it, it's like your bait to, to pastors and to staff and to leadership. They're like, oh man, like they, we can plug them in here. We can get them doing this. We can get them doing that. And my heart for real church is that uh, my friend sent me a book. I read it. I enjoyed it. It was titled Sit, Walk, Stand, short book by a, a wonderful author, Watchman Nee. Uh, man, go go get it on Amazon. It's like $8 on Amazon. It's a short read. Um, or get the audio book if you don't like to read. Um, but the idea that this author presented in this book is that Christians, we always skip this step to sit, okay? Uh, and, and so let me remind you, because I was, I was kind of this week as I was praying and I was looking back on this series, uh, I was thinking about, man, last week, if I'm honest, uh, sometimes there's boring sermons, okay? Uh, how many of you thought last week's sermon was boring? Don't raise your hand. That's a trap. Don't do that. But last week, I thought, I was like, man, uh, some of these sermons are trying to, I, I'm trying to get through it and so I read through the text and there's some sermons I don't get excited about. And honestly, uh, last week was one of them. And here's what the Lord reminded me as those thoughts went through my head was, man, you are reminding your, yourself and you're reminding your church that right now as we journey through the first three chapters of Ephesians, all we're doing is sitting. 
We're looking, if, if you're type A like me, like tell me what I need to do because I need a list to do and I need to get it done so that I can accomplish something. And if I don't leave church feeling like I need to do something, leaving to accomplish something, man, I'm gonna be messed up. Like I need something to focus on and, and, and to do. And so this is what's been hard for me in the first three chapters is, man, I'm just sitting and I'm just reminding our church of how good our God is. And in the first chapter, uh, we saw uh, God's, this is kind of what, how the Apostle Paul laid it out. We see this love from God to us, up to down, to us as his children. And we learn that we were chosen, that we were predestined, that we were adopted, uh, that we were reconciled back to him through Jesus, and that he did all that for us and that he never stopped pursuing you. Some of you would have left church a long time ago. Some of you wouldn't be in this room if God wouldn't stop, uh, if he would have stopped pursuing you. But because in God's rich grace for you, I don't think it's any accident that anybody's in here on accident. I think we're all on here, in here, according to God's will and purpose for our life. And it's only because he loves you and he cares about you and he has shown that in his pursuit for you. And so we see this, uh, this thing that Paul is laying out, he, again, that he's showing God's love to us, and that causes us to sit, or it should cause you to sit. It should cause you to sit and think, man, I would have never chosen myself. I, I'm pretty messed up. Uh, throughout the week, I'm gonna screw up, and yet God still shows his love for me, and that causes me to sit and look at his goodness. And then he goes on into chapter two, what we learn. And then he gives us this picture of this love uh, or so-called love from us to him. So first we got him to us. And then Paul goes, and you would think that if we were to write the book, it'd be like, man, I love God so much. I post my daily scripture every day. Uh, I pray. Uh, I make sure people on Instagram know that I'm a Christian. I'm going to wear my Christian t-shirt today. And this would be the next chapter because of God's love for us. But Paul doesn't go that route. Paul said, no, 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 And I have them all underlined in my Bible, and you should too. It says, no, you were dead. You were dead in your sin. You loved sin. You cared about sin. You enjoyed your sin. You, uh, you were sons of disobedience, right? Uh, it, if I were to come up to you and say, man, you're just a son of disobedience, some of you would look at me like I was crazy, right? Um, but that's what Paul says by nature we are. And he goes on, by nature, you are children of wrath. This, this is language that is not fun to talk about. And then we hit that, but God. And I talked about, man, everyone in this room, uh, you either have had a but God moment or you're gonna have a but God moment. And that but God is, man, I once was selfish. I once only cared about me and my thoughts and my feelings and what I want in this world. But then God came in and man, now I live to serve others, love others, and care for others. I once was all about building this um, pro portfolio through my education and, and building so much wealth on earth, but God reminded me that that's not what's important in this world, that all that is one day gonna end up in a garage cell. It's all gonna end up rusted. And so we see this, but God, that I, I pray everyone can experience. And I think that the Lord wants, he, the word says that he desires all to be saved, that none should perish. And so he wants everybody to have that but God. And I challenged everybody. And I challenge you again, go write your but God moment down. If you're sitting there and you're like, I don't know uh, what my but God moment was. What moment was it that God just captured my heart, that God captured my thoughts, that God captured uh, my will for my life and submitted it to him and said, now it is your will what you want with my life. What is that but God in your life? And so we saw God's love for us, uh, God's love to us, and then we see in return. We didn't return that, but by nature we were uh, children of wrath. But thank God he sent Jesus. And so now uh, as we wrap up chapter two, uh, God doesn't stop. God says, my love to you. And then we, we read in other passages that because God loves us, we can love him back. But the, the implications of that is now relationships with other people. Now, if I'm honest with you, I, and I was, that I read this text and I was like, oh my God, like this, 
some of this stuff that it's talking about, I was like, all right, let's, let's open up my Bible software so it can make me sound smart on Sunday and let's break this thing down. And then I started breaking it down and I started realizing and reading that this is about God's uh, love for us and the implication of that is our relationship towards other people, our relationships with our friends, our relationships with our coworkers, our relationships with our spouse. Now, sometimes if I'm honest, being up here is not fun because I have to open my life up to you guys if I'm gonna be the pastor of real church. And, and uh, one of those, as I read through it, the Lord uh, was just convicting me. Uh, and, and she doesn't know I was going to say this, but her and I got in a, a fight this week, right? Does it, do any other marriages fight out there? Babe, we got the only jacked up marriage in the house. No marriages are. <laughs> some kids are holding up their dad's hands like, yeah, dad, you yell at mom. We got in a fight this week and the Lord just kept reminding me like, man, your, my grace for you should be extended to her and vice versa. His love for my wife should be extended to, uh, to, to me. And Lord knows I need it more than she does. But that's the picture that we're gonna see in Ephesians chapter two, verses 11 through 22 this morning. And so uh, the first part, we, we read this, this description that Paul's laying out and he's saying, hey, at one point there was Jews and there was Gentiles. So the Jews were God's chosen people. Okay, they, they, uh, they almost walked around like, yeah, I, I'm the favorite child, right? Who are the favorite children in the house? Right? I can raise my hand because I was the favorite child, all right? Uh, so we looked at you other ones who don't have your hands up and we're like, you guys are pathetic. Like, if you could only be like me, if you could be the favorite, because man, there's so much favor in being the favorite, and this was the people of God. They knew they were chosen by God, loved by God, uh, that God was for them. And then there was the Gentile people. These were the people who were non-Jewish. And so Jewish people would look at the Gentiles and say, man, if you want to be like me, you need to change your diet. You need to eat kosher. You need to do these things. You need to follow these sets of rules. And this is they map out this whole thing that if you're ever going to be on my level, this is what you need to do. And this caused, in what Ephesians 2 just said, hostility, right? So back in uh, Old Testament days, uh, they weren't like you and I. You and I have access to the Father any time we want. We can stop. We're in the middle of the oil field. We're in the middle of a hospital room. We're in the middle of traffic. You and I can immediately go to the Father, Man, I pray that we don't take that for granted. I pray that we don't forget the goodness in that. Because back before Jesus, people couldn't do that. There was a temple and there were certain levels that certain people could get past. And, and the Gentiles, they wanted to be in the levels where the Jewish people were so badly that the Jewish people had to build literal walls to keep them out. And if they ever found a Gentile crossing those walls, you would get killed by the Jewish people. That's how how much hostility there was. And so as I was reading this and, and thinking about it, uh, I, I was trying to compare like, man, what in our day and age look like uh, the hostility shown between the Jews and the Gentiles in our day? And this is the, the best one I got. It's like in our day, if you are for Trump or you're against Trump, those two groups of people hate each other. I'm not going to get amens on that because we don't want to know who the Trumpers are and the non-Trumpers are. But right, you, if you talk about Trump, you're going to find out real quick what side people are on. And, and what does that cause? It causes hostility between people. And this is the kind of hostility, and, and it, I could argue even more so, that the Jews had against the Gentiles. And that's when it starts talking about, listen, you're uncircumcised. I'm circumcised, and, and I don't want to paint a gross picture, but really what they were doing was they give each other nicknames. If you uh, do some study and maybe even talk uh, to like a sociologist, they would say that people and their natural tendencies give people nicknames to either those who they love or to those who they hate, right? So all of you right now are thinking of the nasty nicknames that you have for people, right? Yeah, Lord forgive us. 
But we also have nicknames, especially uh, being Hispanic. If you get a nickname when you're a kid, it's with you forever. All right. Mine is Chipmunk. Yeah. All right. Because my mom gave me that when I was little. I was eating a cookie in front of a TV one day. She said I look like a chipmunk. It's, she's called me that. My, my girls make fun of me because that's what my mom calls me. But that's what we do uh, to the people that we love and to the people that we hate. And that's what the Jews began to do to the Gentiles. They begin saying, hey, this is who you are. Because we have so much hate and disdain for you. This is what you are. And you're nothing more. And same thing, the Gentiles would look at the Jews and they would look at people. Nobody likes people with their nose in the air, right? And this is how the Gentiles would look at the Jews. And so I, I, I kind of uh, want to talk about this this morning because this is kind of how the outside world looks at the church. Some of you in this room right now, uh, you have this view towards the church, that the church is nothing but a bunch of people with their noses in the air who look down on other people because they think they're better. And, and here at Real Church, I've been trying to kill that from day one because over and over I preach Man, we are all on the same playing field. It's all on level ground and it's at the foot of the cross. So how, how do we uh, get through that in our lives? Because I can ask you right now, what group of people in your mind are you prejudiced towards? Are you prejudiced towards the people for Trump? Are you prejudiced for the people against Trump? Are you prejudiced for people with brown skin? white skin, black skin? Are you prejudiced towards the rich? Are you prejudiced towards the poor? Are you prejudiced to those who have more education than you? Are you prejudiced to those who think and live differently than you? We could go on and on and on because naturally somewhere deep inside of us, there's somewhere where we would look at other people and we're like, I think I'm better than you. And that sounds nasty and gross to admit but it's true oh my gosh that's a fake louis vuitton i'm prejudiced towards them right we're pre we're prejudiced towards the dumbest things oh my house I i'm prejudiced against people who don't have a bigger house i'm prejudiced to people who live in that side of town maybe they live across from uh, maybe they live on the east side you better watch it my wife's from the east side of midland She's probably got a shank in her pocket right now. But that, that, this is how our mind and our heart works. There's prejudice in our hearts somewhere. And the Lord is saying, no, 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 no. You are the same as them. It is only by grace. It was only but God, right? And so he's saying to us in our relationships, towards other people. Stop looking down on other people. If they, if they spend their money differently than you, quit looking down on them. If they live differently than you, stop looking down on them. If they drive a, a, a Chevy, stop looking down on them. Whatever it may be, stop. Let's get our nose down because when our nose is down, our eyes are up and our hearts are on Jesus and we know that it is only because of him and so my challenge to you this morning is where in your heart are you dealing with prejudice? Now, uh, I, I was listening to uh, a sermon and I really like this, what he said. He said, there's a difference between preferences and prejudice, okay? The, you might like to do things a certain way and that's fine. We're not talking about style. What we're talking about is do you elevate that preference to thinking that it is better, that your way is better. It's different, right? Churches do this all the time. We look at other denominations and we say, I don't think you're doing it right. We're, we're doing it right. And so we think we're better than them. We think, uh, the, 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 and I'm just throwing this out, I'm not, this, we think maybe the Baptists feel like they're better than the, the, the Pentecostals and the Pentecostals are better than the Church of Christ and the Church of Christ is better than the Mormons and the Mormons. And, and, and there's so many, we could go down the line. Now, I, I will, let me throw, because I just spit it out. I don't believe Mormonism is Christianity. But you, you got the picture what I was saying that in, in the church world we see, oh yeah, our church does it better than you. Our worship is better than yours. Our pastor preaches better than yours. Whatever it may be. And that just, it, it invades our entire life. 
to thinking that in some way, because I do things a certain way, it's better than you. And my heart this morning is to challenge real church. Man, let's not be people like that. Let's be a people who extend the grace that was once and always given to us because we see that in the scripture. It doesn't, in Ephesians 2, in the, the first part, we see the but God. You were once this, but God. And in today's text, we see the but now. Too many times I think we forget. Uh, you, you, you hear stories all the time. I, I'm a huge guy who likes to hear the stories of people's lives and how they ended up where they are and how they got to the point in their life where they're at. I wanna sit and I wanna talk and I wanna hear that story. And, and most of the time, if you talk to someone, they'll always say, man, I'll never forget where I came from, right? How many of you can say, man, I'll never forget where I came from? Man, I came, some of you came from nothing, right? Some of you came and you, you have made your way through this uh, journey that we call life and you are where you are because you will never forget where you came from. And that's good. You shouldn't forget where you came from. Because I think at times we see and we, we see people and we look at them and it's like, man, they, they forgot where they came from. Why? Because now they think they're better than what they came from. And so we should never forget. And that's what Paul says right here. He says, but now he reminded us, hey, this was you. Don't forget, you were jacked up too. But now, he says, remember that you are no longer aliens. There's no more walls. There should, because of the but now and the but God, you should have no walls in your life of hostility towards other people. Uh, I heard a quote that says, if you idolize something, you end up demonizing the other. In, in context, here's, if you idolize your country, now let me be clear, I'm a proud American. I love our country, and I'm thankful to be have born in the United States of America, the greatest country, I think, on the planet. But if I idolize and I put the, the banner over my life, the American flag, instead of it is finished, that Jesus puts over, I demonize other countries, and I don't care about what's going on in Ukraine and what Russia is doing. I don't care about the poverty that is in South America. I don't care about starving children in Africa. Why? Because I idolize America instead of being thankful that I'm in America, yet having the banner of my life under Jesus and Jesus alone. Some of us might have, we might idolize uh, what, whatever. All of us idolize something. And what ends up happening is you demonize all the other things. And so this morning, I pray that our hearts don't, uh, and the Bible says, Lord, help me. My heart is prone to wander, right? It's prone to wander and idolize things. It's prone to wander, idolize people. It's prone to wander and idolize uh, X, Y, and Z. And when we do that, we end up demonizing and our noses again go back up in the air and we forget where we come from, and those walls are built. And so this morning, some of us might need to pray and ask God, Lord, help me tear these walls down. Help me tear these walls of hostility that I've built up towards the Hispanic culture, towards uh, the, the African-American culture, towards the white culture. Because we're seeing it all over, and not just our country and our world, but it's right here in our city too. Right, we, we, we can drive around, and if you were to take a normal person to drive around, they say, this is where the rich people live, the rich white people live, this is where the Hispanic people live, and you could see it in our schools, right? Because of the way everything's mapped out. But that, all that does is, does is build up these walls of hostility towards one another. We, we saw, and I, I never want to shy away from things of importance in our community. We, we see things happen in private schools, both private schools had incidents happen, right? And I go and I'm reading the comments because I actually work at one of them and I'm reading the comments and I see a bunch of people, a bunch of comments saying, oh man, those the just rich money, white, so-called Christians. So what are they doing? They're doing the same thing that they're accusing the accuser of. And guess what all that ends up doing? 
the Bible calls Satan the, the, accused, the brother of the accuser. The accuser's his title. So what does he want to do? All he wants to do is accuse. Accuse. And if he can get you to accuse, man, you're, you're playing underneath his plan. And so I would challenge you, man, don't give in to those things because all it does is build prejudice in your life. And when you build prejudice in your life, you, you build walls. And the Bible says, and we don't need to have those walls. Matter of fact, you and I aren't to be building stones. We are. Then Ephesians 2 goes on and it finishes. And it says that you and I uh, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Christ Jesus is the cornerstone, right? Not just of real church, but of our personal life. Like everything, all my decisions in my life and for my family and for my children are built upon Jesus and they should be for you as well. Whatever decision you're making, it should be built on the cornerstone of Jesus because the Bible says uh, the fool is the one who builds his house on the sand because when trouble comes, it will come crashing down. And if we've built our house on the sand, it might look pretty for a season, but when that storm comes and your storm will come, your house will come with it. Your life will just, you, you will have no hope. But for those of us who are building our house on the cornerstone of Jesus, you will forever have hope. You can, you can weather the storm because you are a building stone. You are, the Bible says, a living stone, 1 Peter says. And then it goes on to say, you are a living sacrifice in Romans. We are living sacrifices for the purpose of being a living stone to build God's church. Why do we always talk about growth and we, we're growing? And because I see every person as us building. You're, you're, we're all building stones for the kingdom of God. So that just means if someone gives their life to Jesus here at Real Church, another building stone has been added to Christ's church. And, and that's beautiful to me. And, and so I've heard so many times, uh, one day, I, and I still do, I, I pray one day that I get to go uh, to what they call the Holy Land. I pray that one day I get to see the place that Jesus himself walked, that I could go to the tomb that Jesus was once in and defeated. I pray that one day I get to go see uh, just all, all what the Bible uh, lays out. And, and I pray that I get to go see it. But my prayer also is that I never think it's more beautiful than this, right? Because now Jesus is he, he, he's here with us through his spirit. He is here with us now. So that's what makes real church beautiful. That's what makes First Baptist beautiful. That's what makes First Presbyterian beautiful. That's what makes the church of Christ beautiful. It's because we're all living stones and we should as a whole together, we shouldn't be trying to build up walls, but we should be trying to tear them down because we want people to experience the grace of God and how it's changed our life forevermore. And so here at Real Church, that, that, that's the foundation. And it'll always that we want to be real people who point, uh, who point real people to a real Jesus with a real love because that's what we're called to do. And I'm a living sacrifice. And if there's things in my life I got to sacrifice to point other people to Jesus, I will do it. It might hurt, it might be uncomfortable, it might not be fun, honestly, but in the end goal, man, I can say, man, those people were pointed to Jesus. Those people now serve and love the Lord because we pointed them to the right person. And that's the cool thing that we see uh, uh, in the scripture that it plays out, that in our relationships that we are all one in Christ. So whether in this room your skin is white, your skin is black, your skin is brown, man, we're still one in Christ. And we're no better than anyone else. And God forbid we ever look at another race with our nose in the air. And this morning, uh, if the Lord is convicting you, the good news is, man, He can fix that and He can pluck that from your life. Uh, I, I'm thankful that we have a church that I can see all three of those colors in our church. Like that is exciting to me because I want our church to look like our community. I want our church 
to look like heaven. And there's not just one color in those places. It's full of all kinds of people. It's full of all kinds of classes of people. And that is the goodness of God toward us. And it doesn't stop there. And and I'll wrap up with this. Man, I I think it's awesome when people, um, when I was, my wife, I remember being in the garage. I had just uh, resigned from my previous uh, church that I was at. Uh, my wife were, and I were deeply hurt, and, and, I, and I submitted a resignation, and, and we, we walked away in the middle of a pandemic um, with a baby on the way, but I just knew that uh, I, we couldn't serve in this place because of the hurt that we experienced. And I remember sitting in the garage, and I, and I was trying to work out, and my mind was just as a man, like, what am I going to do? My family, how am I going to provide for my family? We're in the middle of a pandemic. We can't hire anybody. Like, nobody's wanting to hire Nobody here in Midland's going to hire anybody with a Bible degree. Like, <laughs> what is that worth in the oil field? Um, and so I just, my wheels were turning like, man, Lord, what am I going to do? And for the next few months, I probably went through the darkest time of my life. And, and I was just asking the Lord, what are we going to do? And, and if it wasn't for my wife, uh, I actually told her uh, the other day, I looked at her and I was like, this is your fault. Like, this is nobody's fault. Real church is your fault. <laughs> and because and, I remember she was, I was ready to go to the oil field. I was ready. Uh, uh, we have family who were ready to give me jobs in the oil field. And I was willing to go sh- uh, broom a shop, whatever I had to do. And, and she looked at me. She says, no, you can't do that. The Lord, uh, this has been in your heart forever to plant a church and, and, and to pastor a church and to love and to lead people. We have to do this. And one of the coolest things that I saw, and I hope they see it this as well, I talked to four men and I said, hey, I, this is what the Lord keeps putting in my heart, in my wife's heart. Uh, we, we, I talked to a pastor. Uh, we, our church, we have a pastor. Like, I have a pastor. Um, and he's going to be here on our one-year anniversary. Uh, you're going to get to meet him. He's going to preach a little bit. Um, and they're the church who, who believed in us and planted us. And um, I told these men, I said, they're ready to plant us right here in Midland, Texas. And... and I, I don't know about you, but and we talked about this in Ephesians 1, but when you're chosen to do something and to partner with somebody, man, there's something special about that. Like th- that, that should come uh, not with pride, but there should be a humility in that. I was like, man, like why would you choose me to partner with, with you? Like I, I, I look at Pastor Terry, the real church's oversight pastor, and I'm like, why, why would you believe in me? Man, you can come up. Uh, why, why would you trust me? You're, you're in Dalhart, Texas. I don't know if any of you know where Dalhart, Texas is. And, and I, I know this man because I worked for him. But even at 15, I, the Lord reminded me at 15, he gave me, uh, a, I was in junior high. And he allowed, no, I was in high school. I'm sorry, I was in high school. And he was allowing me to lead, uh, my friend and I, to lead a junior high small group. And, and when I had no business leading anybody, I couldn't even lead myself. If y'all remember, I was parking my truck at youth group and leaving to go gamble. Like I had no business leading these youth to Jesus. And it's like, it, it just astonishes me every time. I was like, man, he believed in me and, and, and he wanted to partner with me. And so then uh, I go on to, to Bible school. I, I, I earn uh, finish everything that I need to finish. And he calls me, he goes, man, I I need a children's pastor. I'm like, dude, are you me? Like, I don't have any kids. Like, I don't know if I like kids. Like, why would I want to be your children's pastor? But the only thing that I can think of was, man, if God, if this is God's will for my life, I'll do it. And, And that set me up for the next six years of my life. I was a children's pastor. Man, many, I, heck, I tell my wife, uh, we're seeing kid or, Heck, she was in our youth group. Like, he was in our youth group. Like, it's crazy to see these young people. We dedicated uh, one of our youth kids' baby. Like, uh, I shared with you, like, I I think I'm getting old. And I, I, I say all this because over and over and over, I see a perfect God choosing an imperfect person in me to partner with for the message of what Corinthians says of reconciliation. What does that mean? You and I aren't to build up walls. 
but we are to go out and to draw people and to lead people and to choose people and give them the message of hope in Jesus. That is why we exist here at Real Church, is to point people to Him. And over and over, again, in these first weeks of Ephesians, that should cause us to sit. That should cause us to look at our lives and say, man, God, you never left me. You were always there. I never had to worry about putting food on the table for my family because you always provided where I needed to be. You always provided that job. You always provided that next job. You were always good to my family. You were always good to me, God. When over and over, all I did was make decisions that should cause me to separate from you. You said, no, no, no. That draws me closer because where sin exists, grace abounds even more is what the Bible says. And so if you're jacked up in here or you're really jacked up, man, you got some really good grace in your life today if you're sitting in this room and you just believe that. You just believe that you are loved, you're chosen, that he is for you, that he wants good things for you. He wants good things for your family. He wants good things for your children. And this is the message uh, uh, of hope that we have, that we can be forgiven of sin, that we can be forgiven of whatever we've ever done in our life, that we're going to be forgiven for whatever we do in our life. We take that after reading chapter 1 and 2 and, and what we're going to continue to read on. But we see this grace that God extends to us. And he says, now I want you, I want you to go tell that coworker I love them. I want you to go tell that alcoholic family member that I love them. I want you to go tell that addicted uh, person and friend that I love them. Man, that you and I get to partner with God. And here is the coolest thing out of all of this, and I'm done. I know I said that 10 minutes ago, but I, I'm done. That now that we are one in Christ, that there's none better than others, that we are one. He says, not only are you one, but you are my home. And he chose us to be the host, to be the home where he says, I want to live in you. Who does that? I'm not moving into to a house that's messed up and, and, and needs tons of counseling and, and is all, all over the place. I'm going to try to choose the most upright, moral, uh, good person that I could choose. That's what makes us so different from God. God is so good that he says, I choose you. I choose you. And we are now one, and now we, we come together and we get to host. That's why, that, that, that's why I'm not anxious about a building. That's why I'm not freaking about where our next home is gonna be. That's why I'm not worried that uh, I wasn't worried when we were gonna start meeting in a school because a building means nothing because we host the presence of God. You are a carrier of the most precious thing you could ever carry. What a beautiful gift that is. And sometimes I'm not a very good carrier of that. There's many times I have to, uh, I'm sitting and I'm driving, because again, that's where I, I spend my time with God. And I'm like, man, why did you say that? Why did you do that? Why did you react that way? You could have done this, you could have done that. Yet his spirit never leaves me. His spirit says, this is home. And I am rooted and I am planted in you because I love you. And that is the good news of the gospel. So that's why we come here and sing. That's why I can come in here for prayer. That's why I can wake up a little earlier to come and pray. That's why I can give a little more because that news is so good that nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. That's why I can come in here and get excited about church. I don't know about you, but I get excited. I was exhausted last night after being at a softball tournament all day. Yeah, I woke up, I might have snoozed for an hour, but I was still excited when I got up. So I get to spend time with my spiritual family at Real Church. 
I get to love you and I get to lead you and I get to point you to a person who can do all that far than what I can do. And so I, that's why we can sing. So as you stand this morning with me, I, I want to invite you, man, sing, sing, because we sing out of excitement. We sing out of, you, you can stand. That was, that was cute to stand. Y'all are like, do I get up? <laughs> Heck, you can sit. I don't care. You can sit and worship. But worship, worship. If you can get excited about a football game, you can get excited. I can get excited about a softball game, a, a basketball game. If you can get excited uh, about stocks and, and oil going up, and if you can get excited about things that don't matter, can we not get excited at church about a God who loves us, who cares about us, and who wants good for us? And if you can't get excited about it, God says, I invite you into this excitement. I invite you into this kind of love. I invite you into this relationship that I'll never leave you nor forsake you, that nothing on this earth can separate you from me. He says, just call on my name. And so this morning, Josh is gonna lead us in a song of gratitude. That's the song, that's what it's called, gratitude. Sing from a heart of gratitude this morning that a loving, gracious, patient God sees you and cares about you. Father, we love you this morning. We thank you that that is who you are. We thank you, God, that you never stop loving us. So, Father, I pray that that love for us would remove any prejudice in our heart towards anyone that we would remind ourselves that we once were alienated, that we once were ch children of wrath, that we once were children of disobedience. But God, and but now we see your goodness. And Father, I pray for any heart in this room who's never had their but God moment, that right now you would capture them like you've never uh, tried to capture them before, God. That you would reach down deep into their heart and let them know how much you love them. No matter what they think about you, no matter their, their preconceived notions about church and you and Jesus, God, that, that all that would just be uh, overridden by your love and your grace towards them. Father, that you just invite them into this relationship. And Father, for this reason, we sing this reason we can get excited, this reason we can have gratitude in our hearts. We thank you and pray these things in Jesus' name.